welcome back to Horror Queers. We don't have a movie because we're doing some fan mail mailbag thing, right? Yes. I'm Joe. <laughs> and I'm Trace. And this is the first time we're doing this, so bear with us. But it's a special bonus episode for everybody. Um, I know, bonus. Yay. It's not money. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> with lots of long pauses i know uh so yeah listeners um we have been doing this podcast for february march april may four months now did you use your fingers for that yes i did okay. <laughs> <laughs> for four months now and we have asked y'all quite a few questions and gotten quite a few responses and we've also gotten some emails from you guys so we thought we'd do a special mailbag read um a to reward those of you who have reached out to us and engaged with us and b shame the rest of you so this is correct. If you want to hear your name on the podcast, just reply to us or send us shit, and we may read it out on an episode like this. Because we'll, we'll try to do one more than once every four months. No promises, though. But we'll see. I mean, it depends on the volume of responses that we get. When we put out things during the regular episodes, everyone is welcome and encouraged to respond to us. If you do it enough, we will give you more of these bonus pieces. Yes, absolutely. And they're really easy to do because they don't require a lot of thought. So it's fun. Uh, <laughs> I basically took my brain out. Just yes. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a kind of a rundown of all the episodes, not about them, but like the questions we've asked and see what people have said. Because some of you all had some really fun cre- uh, creative responses. But before we do that, I did want to single out some fan mail that we've received. So, Joe, mm-hmm. why don't you take the first one? All right. So our first one is very brief. It's from Scary Jerry, and he says, I love your column and podcast, and I'm your number one fan, but not in that creepy misery foot hobbling way. And I really appreciate that. Um, Although I would take a misery foot hobbling. Really? No, not at all. Um... (laughs) I like that he says he's our number one fan because I feel like we could get some people like fighting with that. Like, who wants to be number one? I'm not going to promote violence, but if for some reason you find yourself in the room with someone who also says they're our number one fan and you want to fight and you want to videotape it and you want to send it to us. I mean, I'm not going to not watch it. Right. I want to see hair pulling though. I love a good elevator cat fight. For sure. So our next one is from Christine and this is actually kind of sweet. So she goes, I just wanted to reach out to you both and say, thank you for the horror queers podcast. I'm an avid listener of the losers club podcast and Halloweenies, um, which in case you didn't know people, we guessed it on the Halloweenies podcast and first heard you guys on the Freddy's revenge episode. I love what you had to add to the conversation. So I decided to check out horror queers. Uh-huh. It's amazing. Yay. I'm sure that's how she said it too. <laughs> You're hilarious, but at the same time, challenge me to think about certain plot points in a different way. And I find it intriguing and refreshing in all honesty i'm really picky about my horror movies and i can read any horror novel and love it but when gore and blood are projected on screen i literally puke i'm kind of a freak so i listen to your episodes and haven't seen most of the movies you covered which is crazy to me so crazy (laughs) no i okay this is that that to me is the biggest compliment we can get if you don't watch the movies or you don't want to watch them but you still listen to us i mean yeah that's great that's some dedication right there yes and this is also really important though she goes i am a heterosexual cisgender female so your podcast has also been an incredible education i'm 29 and thought i knew a good amount about sex you proved me so very wrong (laughs) that (laughs) oh god that is a lot of responsibility I I'm I mean I don't know everything about sex either as we've discussed I don't know a lot about straight sex so I should probably listen to some of those podcasts but that's great if we can educate people about the art of gay sex I'm I'm for it sure anyway you two rock my socks keep up the excellent work boom 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 so thank you Christine that was great all right and our next one is from Sarah and she says um bed best podcast ever It's comprised of horror stuff and gay stuff, which are the two things I've loved more than anything else since I was like four, which I say, good on you. Right. Uh, And you guys are just so on point. I was agreeing so hard with the stuff you were saying on your Scream episode that I literally went, "Mm mm-hmm, out loud on the bus at one point because I forgot I was wearing headphones. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And she says that she hopes that this podcast becomes super famous. Yes. I mean, hey, Sarah, your lips to God's ears, even though I'm kind of an agnostic, but yeah, <laughs> that's fine. So, okay, we won't do any more fan mail, but we're going to move into questions and listener answers. So we're going to go all the way back to our Dead Ringers episode. Now, hmm. I don't really know if we had a question in this one. Oh, wait. Well, I mean, we did. I, 
I kind of asked if watching the movie, as if you've listened to it, it's, you know, about gynecologists, if watching that movie was scarier for women than it was for men. Because I didn't find it scary, but I felt like, I felt pain watching this woman, you know, have her uterus, like, invaded. Mm-hmm. by Particularly those surgery scenes. Yes. So, Rebecca got to write in, and she said, Great ep on Dead Ringers, it is much scarier as a woman. Gyno pain is often ignored, so it really resonates from that perspective. And that's great. I mean, well, not great, I guess. that you know, <laughs> I'm just going to say, that is fucking horrifying. <laughs> Especially with all the shit that's happening with, like, abortion bills in the U.S. and all that stuff. It's like, I can't imagine how women feel their, their bodies are being treated. So, it's... <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, thanks for that input. Again, probably an episode we should have had a female perspective on, so any more information on that is great. Thank you for writing in, Rebecca. All right, so we'll we'll dive a little bit lighter into the Always Shine episode, which is, if you'll remember, I mistakenly misheard one of the drinks that one of the girls orders as a sales rack. Now, wait, we... what, what was the actual drink called? Salzmanac. <laughs> Listeners, Salisbury. it is a Sazerac. Joe, I'm gonna really need you to go order a Sazerac somewhere. Yeah, Sazerac. Saz- what I will it's order. S a z e r a c. Anyway, so yeah, Joe called it a sales rack. So we asked people, what exactly would a sales rack consist of? And so Justin wrote in, and he said, a sales rack starts with a muddled Walmart receipt. A double shot of well-brand vodka from a plastic bottle, an expired cap full of bitters, the last drops of Trace's (laughs) Sazerac, you laugh, and finish with two fingers of high C Ecto Cooler. That sounds fucking disgusting. That sounds delicious. (laughs) (laughs) We have very different opinions on what's delicious. Uh, Okay. I mean, I saw high C and I got it. I swear. If you come for Fantastic Fest, I'm going to take you to get a Sazerac and you're going to be like, oh, wait, do you like absinthe? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. We're, we're good. We're good. That's usually like the make or break it thing with Sazeracs. I mean, it's because it, it doesn't have absinthe in it, but they rinse the glass with absinthe and then they pour it out and then they pour the whiskey and stuff in it. Sounds or, wasteful. Or the rye. I don't know. But it gives like a, t- a hint of licorice flavor. Okay. All right. The, oh, this is... Okay, I'm not going to lie. We didn't get a lot of responses to this question, I think, because people were embarrassed. Very disappointing. I was very disappointed with this. So in our Cemetery Man episode... I mentioned how I'm, when I get drunk, I like to talk about, um, to ask people what they call pe- their partner's um, naughty bits during sex. Because I always find it really, as I said, I find the word pussy kind of gross. So for someone to say like, oh, let me fuck your pussy, uh, it just sounds really weird to me. And as a reminder, in that film, a bunch of different reviewers called the female characters boobs, stuff like melons and jugs and other like really stupid stuff. And so I really wanted like a consensus on what people refer to breasts during sex. Um, or if you were gay, what you refer to the penis uh, during sex. Didn't get any gays talked to us, by the way. Uh, thanks, guys, for nothing. But Brent replied and said, as a straight guy in the bedroom, they're always tits. <laughs> I imagine if I called them melons or jugs while they're out, they wouldn't be out for very long after that. <laughs> Brent gets it. Brent sees where it's at. And again, we're having a lot of straight people respond to us. I'm kind of into that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's not like we're making a gay horror movie podcast for only gay people. Like, Right. No, I mean, yeah, by all means. like, I welcome all the straight listeners in the world if we can educate you. All right. So moving on. In the Daughters of Darkness episode with Ali Gonzalez, we played a game where we talked about who we would cast in a hypothetical modern day remake, and we ended up getting two different answers. So if you remember, there was the Countess Batori, and she had Alona as her lady servant, who she kicked down a sand dune. <laughs> uh, and that's because she was giving it up for blonde chair aka valerie and then valerie was uh recently engaged and married to a shit heel named stefan so uh first response from captain jack gonzo he would have cast the countess uh with rachel vice which is amazing yeah i That's love that That's fantastic great. His Valerie pick was Natalie Dormer from Game of Thrones and The Tudors, and that's another fucking amazing pick. I went to go see the fucking forest in theaters because I like Natalie Dormer so much. So She's amazing. She's actually, I feel like she's almost a little too sexy for Valerie because Valerie's yeah. such a waif in that original film. But if we're sexing it up, yeah. Stefan would have been James Darcy. I don't know who that is. I don't 
know that I know who it is either. <laughs> I was hoping you would. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, that sounds like a fictitious name to me, doesn't it? <laughs> well, because whenever I say Darcy, I just always think of Pride and Prejudice. But, but anyway, I'll tell you. Well, so he plays Howard Stark's butler, Edwin Jarvis. Yes, he was on Agent Carter. There we go. Yes. Uh, he was also in the British TV series Broadchurch, and he was also in Dunkirk. That's an interesting choice. He's a little bit older than I would have expected. He yeah. is. He's 43. But you know what, though? He's kind of um, blah, which yes. is what Stefan is. So yes. yeah, I'll go for that. So Captain Jack's uh, final addition was Lily Sobieski as Alona, which I think is interesting. I, I do, too. I don't think of Lily Sobieski in a sexual way, so that's... It's because yeah. she's so tall. It's, she's so tall. She's like an Amazon. Tall and skinny. But I can kind of, You give her that haircut, that little bob that Ilona has, I think it could work. Hmm. But if she, like, you know, comes out of retirement, because I think she's retired, but whatever. She got kicked by Nicolas Cage too often. <laughs> yeah. So this next group, so this is from James, and this is an interesting mix. It's definitely more Hollywood. So for Batori, he recommends Scarlett Johansson. I can see it. My only thing is, I think she's a little too young. Yeah, she might not have quite the gravitas. But I mean, if you're talking about someone who's immortal and looks gorgeous, sure, Scarlett Johansson. I think she can do the gravitas. I think she can do it. But I, my, you know what? Whatever. She can be as honest as she wants because she's a vampire. Valerie. Now, I, I, I buy this. Dakota Johnson. Yeah. And I think just because Suspiria showed us what she can be like as a sexy ingenue, right? Well, and like, I think she's a very good actress, but I think she can play that plain Jane very well. I mean, she right. does what she can in fucking Fifty Shades, but, Ooh. you know, whatever. Now, here's an interesting one. So for Stefan, he gives us Ryan Gosling. Who is definitely not milquetoast and boring. I know. I was like, maybe he's too sexy. Um, he's I mean, sexy. I'm not going to say no to watching I mean, Ryan I'm not Gosling. I'm going to say no to Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe that maybe that's what you do. I mean, like you you make him sexy. It's a different interpretation of the character. I mean, you really amp up that love triangle, right? If you make him more of a viable, appealing partner. Yeah. And then lastly, so I think this person, <laughs> I think this person just watched Suspiria. Ilona he gives to Chloe Grace Moritz. Now, granted, I will say I can see Chloe Grace Moritz more in this role than I can Lily Sobieski. Yeah, me too. I just don't think I like Chloe. Grace Moritz anymore. I'm leaning there now, only because I haven't seen her do anything that's different. Worthwhile? <laughs> well, no, not even worthwhile, but like she just plays this on it. It's kind of kick ass's fault. Yeah, she started so strong. She no, she did. And but she's been typecast as that girl who's like kind of a bitch and says fuck a lot and like whatever, which I'm never gonna say no to, but I said really? that twice. I would actually argue that she's been typecast as like the Maeve flower kind of wah role ever since let me in see and i was thinking like kick ass kick ass two neighbors two she's like the bitchy sorority girl so i was thinking let me in carrie carrie Suspiria. yeah i guess maybe well chloe and grace moritz if you listen to this do something else <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't play a wallflower and don't play a bitch yeah for sure all right moving on so, thinking about our Oculus episode, we asked for sibling stories or sequel ideas. So, we'll start with Brandon. So, he says, The first person I came out to was, in fact, my five years younger brother. We were roommates at the time. Then again, I didn't really have the opportunity to come out to him exactly. I said, I have a coffee date on Tuesday. And he responded with, Oh, how did you meet him? <laughs> Presumptuous. <laughs> the yeah. rest of my comings out, is that plural, went roughly the same with my family staring at me like I was telling them old news. Which, that's... Yeah. yeah. That okay. kind of reminds me of me where people were like, oh, okay, well, thanks for, you know, finally getting around to it. Let me tell you, though. So I think the, the way that the brother handled the situation is actually fine. What I hate, though, and I didn't have... Well, actually, no, I did have this issue, is when people were like, yeah, dude, we already knew. Don't yeah. ever fucking tell someone that when they come out to you. <laughs> That's really enough. fucked up. They it's, don't, I, yeah, people don't need to hear, oh, I knew all along. It's like, oh, okay, well, good to know I've been suffering in silence. Yeah, it, just say, thank you for telling me. I love you. Nothing changes. Like, that's exactly. it. You're good. Those those literal sentences go a long way. Yeah. But, Brandon, thank you for letting us know. Mm -hmm. 
And then Jerry gave us a sequel idea, which again, I know we discussed it. I don't, I mean, it's never going to happen, but, no, no. <laughs> but, but we love the idea. I love the idea. Uh, so he says it opens in a wood shop as the frame is being made. It forwards to man breaking into a museum and finding his way to the archives. He finally finds what he wants, the lasser glass. In the darkness, mirror people start appearing all around him, including the woman in the red hair ponytail, which I think he's mm. referring to Karen Gillan. Yeah. <laughs> The story progresses from there with the woman, Madam Something, ordering the glass from her seance room. The glass has to be made f to her exact specification, and unlike other glass or mirror, security finds the man in the storage area in the nick of time, but they know each other. We follow each storyline. The mirror was created for spiritualists. They all die mysteriously. The mirror only haunts descendants of the woman and can only moderately affect others. The man at the beginning is Tim's son, and, the, and Tim and his partner... Mm, yes. Because he assumes Tim is gay. Boom! That's Jerry's words. Is ailing and old and, and told his son about his aunt. Determined to find the mirror and destroy it. Now he goes, the mirror cannot affect him because he is not a direct descendant. Adopted. Boom! They it's load the twist, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Uh, they load the mirror into the truck, and he drives off to destroy it. The last scene has Madam telling the spiritualist that the mirror must never be destroyed, or the evil will escape into our realm. I love that ending. That is, yeah, that's one of those things where you think that you've won, and then it's that last second reveal, like shit, what have we actually done? It's kind of fun because it's a Pandora's box kind of situation. And I like that it also keeps the narrative framework of like going between past and present. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of spiritualist as well. I think I can, now I can't remember if during that episode we we specifically talked about the idea of the mirror being tied to some kind of spiritualist movement. It would be perfect for sure. So, yeah, I'm into it. I wish it would happen. But Jason Blum's already put the kibosh on it. So <laughs> so we are ending this with the most responses we got on an episode which i think is actually also our most popular episode to date which is carrie 2 shocking to me by the way I, I was shocked by how many people wanted to listen to this episode it's because you trash talked cat shay and then she actually publicly responded to you so <laughs> yeah but she didn't mention that so it's fine all right so yeah so we asked people uh if they were willing to share their bullying stories with us so yeah we got quite a few responses and we'll start with uh schlock horror I don't know this person's name, and I feel like I really want to. I should probably ask this person. I'm assuming it's a man, but it might not be. Oh, actually, no, it's a man, based on this okay. story. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Schlock Horror says, I remember the first time I got called faggot. Like you boys, I didn't even know what it meant, but it was all due to my known love of Buffy. I was ridiculed for years for that, which I think he actually followed up with a couple of other tweets that clarified... He did but basically yeah like no one i think he's from australia australia yeah and like, i guess no one watched it on that island continent mm -hmm. uh <laughs> and yes yeah, so, but like that led to him getting made fun of and i just want to say fuck all you people who did that because a there are a lot of things that you can do to get called that word watching buffy and liking buffy should not be one of them yeah, it's such a, a weird idea. It's, you know, it's not even behavioral or attitudinal. It's, you know, oh, you watch a certain type of entertainment and therefore you must be gay. So, well, yeah, I guess that's I remember being in middle school, though, and like someone asked me who my favorite singer was. And as we know, I don't do music, so I didn't know who to say. So mm. I said Cher because my dad listened to Cher. <laughs> And I didn't know Cher was, like, a gay thing. And boom, there you go. I was the kid that liked Cher. Whereas I was just the kid who couldn't throw a Frisbee correctly, and therefore, because I lifted up a leg to balance, I must be gay. Mine was when you throw the basketball, and, like, you hop up on one leg, and the other leg goes up. Like, um, what's that movie where she wants to kiss, and she wants the pop when she kisses? Like, she wants her leg to pop? I think it's Anne Hathaway. Right, yeah. Is it? No. I think it's The it, Princess Diaries. Are you Diaries. sure it's not Legally Blonde? No, it, it's the Princess Diaries. There we go. Yeah, because she she it's only true love when your leg pops when you kiss. So that, that's what I did though when I was throwing a basketball. Oh, <laughs> a little gay trace. So gay trace. <laughs> the next one, Eleanor writes in. So she goes, "When I was in junior high, the thing at the time was to make your own X page, like an early version of MySpace." See, I thought that the early version of MySpace was like Zanga or Friendster. Maybe. Um, so she goes, I made one I made one and classmates saw it as me jumping on the bandwagon slash copying others because I used similar a, a similar URL style as someone else, my first and middle name. Which just sounds like the obvious way to do it. These people sound like cunts. Yes. 
So, but everything else was different. Uh, I tried to make layout, the layout slash graphics look really good. I really got into HTML at the time. That's a skill everyone should have, and I wish that I knew it. Yeah, good on you. <laughs> then on my page's guest book, someone left an anonymous trollish comment that was like, you suck and your page sucks. If you don't take your page down, I'll kill you. Which is severe. Yeah, uh, y'all, like, I'm not promoting bullying, but if you're gonna bully, don't do death threats. <laughs> It's really fucked up. No, just don't do it at all. And d- and don't bully, period. But I mean, like, if you, for some reason, you, like, find the hand of the devil, like, compelling you to bully someone, don't threaten to kill them. Anyway, I ignored it and then kept my page up. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to be seen as a tattle. But sometimes I find myself to this day wondering who wrote it. Maybe that person was just joking, but death threats are way dark, man. Were the sparkly animations on my page too triggering? Sounds like it. That's so fucked up, man. Like, I... And, and the fact that she never knew who it was, because it's anonymous, you know, like that that's scarier to it's me. the start of internet culture, man. The minute that we could start doing things anonymously, people just turn into total assholes. Well, now I want to look up whatever this, what is it called? X page. I'm going to look this up and see what that was, because that's, I've never heard of that. I imagine because she had to code it, it was probably like a fairly rudimentary kind of, you get to pick your colors by writing in the code and stuff. Right. Anyway. You keep looking. I'll read the next one. So we have one from Joshua. He says, at 16, a boy offered to pay me to go to prom with him because he and his friends thought it would be funny for two guys to go together. As I was the only out gay guy in our year, they thought I'd be up for it. And I said yes. Uh, And then face palm emoji. Hmm, Poor Joshua. Because I didn't understand what it implied, and I was so desperate to be cool. Then I spoke to an older girl who was like, no. And so I went back and told the guy how degrading it was. And he was like, oh, I didn't realize. Really points out the lack of self-awareness at that age. The amount of diet homophobia I grew up with and that how much of it I carried around myself. But it's all good. For the most part, my school experience was pretty painless. I had theater, which I was good at and took up all my time. I hear you. And I knew what I really wanted to do. So I was lucky. Honestly, this this is one of those examples where I could see people saying, oh, well, that's not really like homophobia. That's not bullying. And it's like, well, it's it just to me reveals a lack of awareness. Like, oh, because this kid is the only gay kid, he must want to go to prom with me as some kind of novelty joke. And you're just like, this is a human being. They're not there for your enjoyment or pleasure. I yeah, I hate I hate that. <laughs> um, P.S. Uh, I just googled X page. It's not, it doesn't even have its own Wikipedia page, but it is it does have an Urban Dictionary page, and it's really oh, no. funny. I'm gonna just read the first paragraph. Xpage.com is a little community of web pages controlled by a little fascist bastard living somewhere out in Diarrhea, Nebraska. <laughs> You have the option to make a free page that will ultimately look like shit, no matter how skilled you are, and be flooded with ads, or for the low price of $736.99 a month, you can make what? a page that will ultimately look like shit that they suck money out of you for much like walking into, uh, out of you, out of you for, much like walking into Nordstrom. <laughs> wow. There's a couple more paragraphs that I won't read, but it's really funny. <laughs> It's like someone had a very personal negative experience. I'm going to start saying diarrhea in Nebraska because I've never been in Nebraska, but I'm, yeah. Uh, Apologies to anybody who listens who lives in Nebraska. Believe it or not, we don't have a lot of Middle West listeners. Um, Sorry, Midwest listeners, because I'm just so you know, I can see where all you're listening from. (laughs) Creepy and threatening. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so I've got another one from that guy 4442 When I was a kid, my sister and I would go to movie theaters all the time. We lived in Arizona where it's hot. So the movie theater was a popular place for kids. Oh, I'm so glad you read this one because when I looked through it, I was like, what state is AZ again? Oh, Arizona. (laughs) Did I say AZ or did I say Arizona? No, you said Arizona. Arizona, Fuck yeah. It's okay. I wouldn't have gotten Ontario. (laughs) (laughs) O-N. Okay. I had to be 14 or 15 and we went to see Blair Witch 2. Yeah. Fuck yeah, you did. I know. And afterward, we were waiting on our mom to pick us up. This car filled with high school boys pulled up and a kid leaned out with a map asking where something was. I went to show them on the map where it was located and another kid rolled down his backseat window and pelted me with whipped cream covered pie. What the fuck? It was awful. I was so mortified. If I had Carrie's telekinesis, that entire car full of bastards would have gone up in flames. (laughs) Bet your ass they would have. I can laugh about it now, but back then I was so upset. I refused to even go back to that specific movie theater for a bit. Yeah, um, you got a fucking pie in the face unexpectedly. Like, which, like, what even instigates that? Was that just a? Ra- all right, th- all right. 
I'm going to, that's boys being stupid boys. I'm going to tie this into one of mine then too, because I actually, I think I suppressed this memory, but I remember walking out of my front yard one day. Oh, cause my parents came in in, uh, the, in my room and they said, Hey, we got teepeed. And I was like, that's weird. So I walk outside and we're teepeed. That's toilet papered for people who don't know. Oh yeah. Sorry. All over our trees. We have the, cause we lived in a place in uh, the suburbs of Houston called pecan grove and so they were known for their pecan trees so we these two huge pecan trees and then also a magnolia tree in our front yard so they were just tp to shit Hmm. but that wasn't the worst part they someone had shaving creamed faggot and trace loves the cock on our sidewalk Hmm. not untrue i yeah not untrue but i was in (laughs) i was in seventh grade it was i was 13 years old and in case you don't know when you shaving cream a sidewalk it bleaches the sidewalk (gasps) no so Even after you wipe it off, it's still stained on the concrete. And it was for months. Oh, I bet your parents love that. Well, they thought it was just, they thought it was a boys being boys thing. Because I mean, I came out to them three or four years later and they were quote unquote shocked. So, I mean, that that was, when I saw that, I was like, fuck, they're going to know that I might be gay. Because even at the time, I wasn't 100% sure if I was gay or not. I didn't realize until I was 14. And so that was like my thing. And I mean... Apparently it was fine. I don't even know if they remember that, to be honest, but I remember the fuck out of that. Well, because this is the thing, and this is what I feel like we learn from all these people writing in, is even things that other people might consider innocuous or harmless, if if they affect you in a particular way, they can be so harmful because you just hold on to them and you keep revisiting them in your mind for years afterwards. Yeah. <sighs> so, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that, like, one of my worst, like, bullying moments of, like, when someone, like, Without face-to-face bullying, like, it's like... And I, what I hate is I never found out who did it. I never found out who did it. Yeah, you never do. I hate that. I wish oh, I wish I could know. All right. <sighs> uh, we have a long one from Rebecca next. So she says, My carry moment really wasn't about my queerness. I went to an inner-city middle schooler for 5th and 6th grade where I was bullied pretty relentlessly. I didn't fit in with the other suburban kids, and the other students thought I was weird and annoying, which, to be honest, may have been true. You know what, Rebecca? Fly your freak flag. Yeah. Additionally, I had stick straight hair all throughout first to fourth grade. The summer that before I entered middle school, my hair became extremely curly. My mom had no idea what to do with it, as she had really fine straight hair. Problematic. Hmm. At the same at this time, even when I showered that day, my hair was unruly and looked kind of greasy all the time. This was fertile ground for the other students to make fun of me. Yeah, you bet your ass it was. One day before Christmas break, my sometimes friend was standing in front of my locker looking uncomfortable. I asked her what was up and noticed this whole group of popular kids nearby yelling for me to open my locker. Yeah, fuck. Yeah. I did, and there was a little grooming set in real blue. It had a comb, a brush, a portable mirror, and a caddy. I was kind of trusting kid, and I thought that my friend had bought it for me for Hanukkah because we were close. I thanked her and hugged her for the gift, and the popular crowd erupted in laughter. It turned out that they had all chipped in and bought it for me as a joke because they all thought (sighs) I never showered and I didn't know how to take care of myself, which is fucking shit. Fuck. The rest of the year, whenever I sat in front of someone in class, they would complain they could see lice jumping on my head or that I smelled awful. Of course, that year I actually did get lice, which is just the shit on the goddamn diarrhea sandwich. It seems like a small incident. No, it does not. No. But it crushed me at the time. I tried to cut school anyway. I knew how. I got into fights, and I cried almost daily. No. Uh, and the worst thing about this is that Rebecca doesn't say that she grew up into, like, an amazing person and that she managed to, like, kick all these assholes to the curb. Like, yeah. I really wanted some kind of, like... I mean, I, I, Rebecca, I'm sure you are an amazing person now. I'm mean, not that you were before, obviously, but... Yeah, it's again, it's like something so fucking little because kids latch onto these little things, and it also goes to show you also how young it starts. I mean, first or fourth yeah. grade, like that's it, yeah. Kids are the worst. Like, and I, I wish teachers would do more about it because I obviously they can't see everything. Like, I I know that, but there are things where it's like teachers, like look mm-hmm. at these fucking kids. Yeah, if you see someone being well, I mean, I would hope that there's more emphasis put on it now that bullying has become such a like an epidemic in the u.s and yeah i mean it's i know people think that it's not a big deal but it's like stuff like this can be enough to kill yourself on no it's i mean 
Ugh, it's really upsetting. So I'm sorry, Rebecca, that really sucks. But you know, you are who you are today. And you sound like a great person. Yes. Yeah. So our last read is from Wyatt. Uh, he's actually written this a couple times, but I picked this one specifically to use for him. So he goes, uh, like so many other gay teenagers, I was not out, but clearly exhibited signs of otherness that caused me to be ridiculed and ostracized. Like Trace, Friends' older female siblings called me out on my homosexuality almost right away. And while I on think the that was actually me, not you. But... Yeah, that was you. Sorry, I, I was reading that and I was like, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> Which is fine. Don't worry, why people confuse us all the time. <laughs> yeah, they really do. I don't. I don't understand. I think we sound different, but whatever. <laughs> well, on the one hand, it was kind of a badge of honor to be accepted by someone's cool older, i.e., over legal drinking age sibling. That same information in the hands of a junior high schooler was dangerous. Yeah, no. Like Joe, I also did my best to avoid situations slash locations that I considered dangerous. But unfortunately, in the state of Illinois, physical education was, is, mandatory in high school for a full four years. So there was no way I could avoid locker rooms and aggressive jockeyness. Yeah, fuck that. I feel that. So, basketballs to the face, kicks in the exposed while changing a uniform, balls, shoves into the baseball diamond dirt, and everyone deathly afraid of being my wrestling sparring partner was par for the course. I never had to do wrestling. That wasn't a thing. We didn't, we didn't have a wrestling team. We had extracurricular wrestling, but thankfully, yeah, that didn't prove to be a problem. But I can imagine it's like, ooh, don't touch the gay kid. Mm-hmm. P.S. Um, I feel like there is always a murder happening outside your apartment. <laughs> I do live near a fire station. You've mentioned that before, and I always forget. And I'm like, God damn! Like the the crime wave in Toronto is just really going nuts. All right, so why Bergian motors? Yes. So why it continues? Moreover, many of the teachers themselves encourage this behavior. See, teachers, I think it would be considered yeah. illegal or at least grounds for termination today, but this was at the tail end of the old guard, toughen you up no matter what mentality best exhibited by the drill sergeants masquerading as gym teachers and coaches. So they got away with it. Yeah. Did it make me a stronger person? Yep, but not in the way they intended. Now, this is, uh, this is the end. Uh, horror movies were, of course, my escape from reality, and as has been mentioned numerous times by others, I think the escape from any outsiders of the junior high slash high school social structure. The nature of otherness inherent to most horror films is, I think, the strongest magnet to queer people. But the enactment of revenge fantasies on screen and other subversions of, most frequently, suburban teenage life is, I think, what keeps us coming back, especially at that age. Now, I know that sounds bad. I fully agree. Um, I think, <laughs> and I'm not, because I really gravitate towards revenge movies, and I never have a have a moral ambiguity when it comes to rape revenge, when it, people are like, well, she's becoming a murderer, and that's bad, and I'm like, mm, I don't know. And, and like, I kind of want to see her absolutely massacre all of these assholes. Yes, and granted, do I want to see her get raped? No, and like, I wish that that never happened, but whenever people like have like the moral dilemma about like when the woman turns on them. I never have that dilemma, and that's maybe problematic, that's maybe a problem, but I always yeah. just envision, like, the bullies that I used to grow up with. Right. It's hard not to cheer during those moments in Carrie. Yeah. So he says, and if you were a junior high, if you were in junior high slash high school in the late 90s or early 2000s, you were privy to a particularly categorical and narrowly focused portrayal of teenage types and social structure that, in the unfortunate absence of adequate evidence to lifestyles to the contrary, was merely perpetuated by the real-life teenagers they represented. Yeah. It's, yeah, it... Well, and people take their cues for movies, too, right? So they see these people who are popular, and they're absolute dicks. And if you're anything else, then you're a geek or an outsider, or... That's why, though, representation is very important in any kind of media, be it film, TV, whatever, or any genre, because if people see it, and it's quote-unquote normalized, or, you know, not treated as anything, like, you know, mm -hmm. jokey... Um, I just listened to a We Hate Movies episode on a Do, Do Where's My Car, and apparently there's like a, like a whole section of the movie that focuses on um, transgender humor. That film is so fucking terrible. I, I've only seen it once, and I was like, li what, 11 when it came out? So I haven't seen it in like almost 20 years. But yeah, I mean, it, the way it sounded, it was like, oof, like, thank God we don't live in 2000 anymore. It sounds terrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. And on the flip side, I just saw the new movie Booksmart, and that film is just casually populated with, like, people of color, with, like, the main character. There's two of them. One is an out lesbian. The other one is, like, a plus size for Hollywood, a.k.a. totally regular girl. Mm -hmm. And the film is just, like, casually populated by all of these different people. And it's, like, it's, that's just it. That's the world. And it's I'm, fantastic. I'm so fucking excited for that movie because it got it got raves at South by Southwest, but it's also directed by Olivia Wilde, who I love. And yes. 
And the girl who plays the lesbian, um, we're having a bad teacher student renaissance because the girl who plays the lesbian is Sasha, the little nerdy girl in Bad Teacher. And uh-huh. the the girl who plays the bitch in Bad Teacher is Catherine Newton, who is currently in Detective Pikachu. Oh, so yay! <laughs> Everything's coming up Bad Teacher, which we all know you love. Which we all know I love, and everyone should go watch Bad Teacher because it's also one of my five-star reviews on Letterboxd. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our mailbag. As we mentioned off the top, obviously, we love hearing from you folks. You know, we encourage you to tweet us. But obviously, if you send us emails like this, that can be a little bit longer. We're happy to read them on the air. Mm -hmm. And as we said, if we get a bit more of these, we can do these a little bit more regularly. So they feel maybe just a touch more timely. Yeah. And if you're tweeting us, that's totally fine. Some of these I piece together through multiple tweets. Um, But you either have to tag us or you have to use the horror queers hashtag. If you don't do either one of those things, we're not going to find them. Yes. We're not freaking internet sleuths. I know. It actually took me like an hour to find some of these. So oh. it was fun. But <laughs> I guess on the note, we can cross out our very first mailbag episode. Woohoo! And cross out horror queers. <laughs> This episode was brought to you by the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network, delivering your weekly horror podcast fix. To find more episodes of this show and others, please visit bloodydisgusting.com backslash podcast network. Get in, losers. This is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers, from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all. Would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. (laughs) hello i'm shelby scott the host of scare you to sleep a podcast where i tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror this is a show for those of us who have realized Horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares. Like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.